webinar, Intersectional Solutions, Advancing Racial and Economic Equity for Survivors of Color and Immigrant Survivors. Um, I'm going to invite Lisa Lynn Jacobs, uh, CSAJ's Policy Director, as well as Erica Sussman back to help um, introduce um, our panelists today, as well as get a sense of who's in the room. So Lisa Lynn and Erica, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thanks so much, Sarah. This is Lisa Lynn Jacobs, the Policy and Legal Director for the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. We wanted to get started by getting a sense of who has joined us today. So please chat with us and tell us who's in the room, uh, what organizations do you represent, what is, you know, what's your piece of the pie? Are you an advocate? Are you a legal services lawyer? Are you a survivor? Um, are you several of those things at the same time? We very much want to know who's joined us today. And again, welcome. And while people are sharing how they've joined us today and what work they're engaged in, I'm going to turn it over to CSAJ's Executive Director, Erica Sussman, to give us a little bit of background on the organization. Great, thank you so much, Lisa Lynn. Thank you, Sarah. I'm just looking at all of the um, comments coming in along the side and we have a very um, rich group of participants joining us today with varied background um, and perspectives. And I'm really looking forward to everybody contributing their own experiences, perspectives um, to today's conversation. So thank you all for joining us and sharing. Um, my name is Erica Sussman and I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for Survivor Agency and Justice. CSAJ was born a decade ago in response to an overwhelmingly service-driven and compartmentalized approach to advocacy for survivors. Lawyers, advocates, survivors, and communities were sharing experiences with us that showed that oftentimes advocacy was irrelevant to survivors' needs, and many times our systems were punitive or more abusive than the violence that survivors had themselves suffered. And CSAJ was created to translate survivor-centered philosophy into practice. It will come as no surprise that once we centered the lived experiences of survivors, economic needs often surface as a critical barrier to safety. And that has been the space where we have focused much of our attention. CSAJ has an ambitious vision. We envision a world where all people have equal access to physical safety, economic security, and human dignity. And we strive for this vision through our mission. CSAJ promotes advocacy approaches that remove systemic barriers, enhance organizational responses, and improve professional practices to meet the self-defined needs of domestic and sexual violence survivors. We have three main projects. Today's webinar is part of our Racial and Economic Equity for Survivors project, otherwise known as REAP. We also have another national project that's been around since 2007 called the Consumer Rights for um, Domestic Violence Survivors Initiative. And that focuses on enhancing the capacity and partnerships around consumer and economic civil legal advocacy. And then we have another project called Accounting for Economic Security um, with a newly released atlas. I'll tell you about all of these things at the end of today's programming. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the program back to Lisa Lynn Jacobs to talk about the REAP project. Great, thanks so much, Erica. Um, as Erica shared, REAP is one of three projects that CSAJ has. Uh, it is the project that is doing the work that is being centered on the webinar today. Um, and it has several components. Its goal is to increase grantees' capacity to address racial and structural and institutional biases, particularly as they pose barriers to survivors' economic stability. Um, the REAP project has several different parts. It has two partner impact sites, 
Enlace Comunitario in New Mexico, and Oklahoma City Artists for Justice in Oklahoma. Um, it has an additional several parts. It, it will focus on an impact assessment. We are putting together a legal resource library. We're gonna do some work with survivors and a version of StoryCorps. We also provide technical assistance on these issues. Um, in addition to CSAJ, we have six partners and two consultants providing technical assistance on this project. Uh, they are Women of Color Network, Southwest Center for Law and Policy, the API or Asian Pacific Islander Institute on Gender-Based Violence, Casa de Esperanza, the Texas Council on Family Violence, the Kirwan Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, and our two consultants uh, who bring to us a vast history and background with legal services, among other things, um, are Camille Holmes and Bill Kennedy. Uh, and so today, the webinar is the third in a series that the REAP Project has put on. The other two uh, have been archived and you can access them via the CSAJ website. The first one that we did in January was a racial and economic equity for domestic and sexual violence survivors and featured all of the uh, consultants and REAP partners talking about their work and how it is centered in racial equity work. And the second, which was done at the end of March, was titled Race Equity Approaches to Domestic and Sexual Violence, a Research and Community Lawyering Perspective. Um, and that one involved a dialogue particularly from uh, Bill Kennedy and Camille Holmes who come to us with a background from legal services and legal aid talking about how those particular racial equity tools that they use uh, can be used and applied in the context of the domestic and sexual slash racial justice advocacy that so many folks who are listening today do. Um, so I look forward, the last two webinars have had a fabulous and rich discussion with the chat while we have been engaged by the substance. Without further ado, uh, the bulk of the webinar is going to be led by our partners at Women of Color Network and at Casa de Esperanza. So I'm going to turn it turn it over now to Porvi Shaw of Women of Color Network to start talking about why they do and how they do the tremendous work and advocacy that they're engaged in. Oh, um, lovely. Oh, um, good afternoon, y'all. It is so lovely to be able to um, be with you today. I'm so excited to see so many of your names on the attendees list and so grateful for the work that you do every day and just so grateful to be part of this community. So thank you so much to CSAJ for hosting this webinar and being our partners. And um, also to Pierre and Rosie, I'm so excited for the information we're all gonna be able to provide to you. So we really want you to be able to be energized within our current climate, to be able to work with survivors in a way that honors our whole lives and to work from a holistic and intersectional context and we're going to be talking about systemic barriers and really hoping to give you tools and resources. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, so we wanted you um, to really be able to, again, interact with the work that we're doing. So throughout the chat, feel free to show how and speak to how racial, gender, and or cultural bias is showing up in your work with survivors. And of course, also in terms of economic security issues. So we'd love to hear from you how you're seeing this in your day-to-day -day experience, even as we describe some of the work that we've been seeing. Next slide, please, Sarah. So we wanted to really start by um, poising why we exist. And um, I'm gonna start um, in terms of the work of the Women Col of Color Network. Next slide, please. 
Um, and I'm so honored. My name is Purvi Shah. I know many of you and so grateful to know you and your work. And I'm a senior consultant with the Women of Color Network and so happy to be able to work with WSAN Inc., an independent nonprofit, in terms of our work and gender violence. Um, here you have a little bit of uh, information from our CEO, Tanya Lovelace Davis. Um, who has been a visionary in terms of ensuring that the voices of women of color, indigenous women, are part of our work to end gender violence. One of the reasons that we exist as an organization is that we see violence across many issues. And so as you see from Tanya's letter, we see the violence faced by Sandra Bland, by Tyrone Gaines, by in Orlando, and all these other modes of violence that we see within indigenous and um, people of color communities as also related to gender violence. And I want to lift up one of the terms that um, one of our staff members, Reverend Elise Moore Orby uses. When we talk about violence against women, we're also talking about violence in women's lives. So it's not simply thinking about gender violence, but about violence broadly, and then how the various modalities of violence intersect and also reinforce gender-based violence, as well as the resources and options that communities have. So at a very basic level, the Women of Color Network exists to honor our whole realities, to honor the many modes of violence that women of color and indigenous women experience and that our communities experience, and to be able to offer intersectional solutions. Next slide, please. So you'll see here our mission is a reflective of that and that our goal is to eliminate violence against all women and our communities by centralizing the voices and promoting the leadership of women of color across the sovereign nations, the United States and the US territories. We wanna make sure to connect issues including DV and sexual assault as well as police brutality and over incarceration which we'll be speaking to directly today. And we want to understand that our work is done in the context of intersecting oppressions, including colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, and ableism and other forms of oppression that intersect with violence against women of color and our communities. So I know that's a big vision, but that's really how we live our lives. And we want to be reflective in our work of these intersecting oppressions and our intersecting solutions. I'm gonna pass it now to Pierre and Rosie to give you the a vision of the amazing work that Casa de Bronze is doing in our communities. Sure, thank you so much, Purvi. Um, hi everyone, this is Pierre Berastain from Casa de Esperanza. And I'm just gonna go really quickly over, over what we do and, uh, and hopefully that gives you a better idea of why we're here. So our mission at Casa de Esperanza is really to mobilize Latino communities to end domestic violence. And uh, I, I like to say, or I don't know if I, I like to say, but I, I, I will point out that we've kind of outgrown that mission in the sense that we started in, the 19, in 1982 as a, as a small organization in the Twin Cities in Minnesota to uh, specifically to, to mobilize communities to end domestic violence. But over the years, we've grown to a, <coughs> to a national organization, excuse me, that really works on sexual assault, on um, human trafficking, at the intersection of, of all these forms of violence and immigration and, and, and systems advocacy. So, so um, you know, it's, it's rare that an organization gets to, if you will, um, to, to expand beyond its, its, its mission, but we are one of those that we have just, you know, wanted to take on the world, if you will. And so, so that's, uh, that that's uh, worth worth noting and but it is important to pick something an essence from this mission that i think is that, that guides all of our work uh, to this day and that is that communities are going to end these forms of oppression you know violence uh, against women sexual assault sexual violence human trafficking and it's not that systems are going to end it we don't believe that systems or a specific organization is going to end it uh, even though oftentimes it is systems that are that perpetrate harm, uh, but it really is that that communities is when, when communities kind of uh, take on the reins of this work and 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 become um, more informed and active that that we begin to make progress because these issues exist within our communities and so um, so it is it is up to us to you know to to prevent them. Um, 
uh, through our work, we emphasize developing social capital, uh, reciprocity, you know, such as information sharing, cooperation, trust, you know, what do we know as social capital, because we believe that social capital really decreases domestic violence. Uh, so on the next slide, um, we have, if we can move on to the next slide, please, we have, thank you, we have the National Latino Network, and we have a, 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 a specific, you know, service-oriented uh, local program in the Twin Cities, but we also have the national work through the National Latino Network for Healthy Families and Communities, and, and that uh, means that we are the culturally specific resource center, national resource center, center serving Latino communities, and the main elements of the NLN, the National Latino Network, are, we, we do tremendous amount of, of training and TA to coalitions, to organizations, culturally specific organizations, to federal agencies, um, state and local agencies, et cetera, et cetera. So we do a lot of training, capacity building and, and, and technical assistance um, through our work. We also engage in a lot of public policy in DC with a, a, with a number of federal agencies around rules, regulations, around you know what, what are the laws that are being passed, what might be the unintended consequences and impact on survivors of violence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also have a research center uh, in which we do research around the intersections of violence and Latino identity or, or uh, immigration, for example. And then we have uh, a group uh, uh, a group of staff that works in communications to ensure that that we are raising awareness and 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 making our community aware of resources, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a little bit of of, of the pillars of of the National Latino Network. Um, so just to kind of explain why, why we exist, which was the original question, we have about 53 million Latinos living in the United States, which amounts to about 17% of the population. And of course, we know that it's a, a tremendously heterogeneous group that come from number of, a number of socioeconomic backgrounds, cultural, linguistic um, origin, uh, linguistic backgrounds, origins, and, and, and they, they are so varied um, so diverse that that we need very nuanced ways to work with different populations. About 40% of Latinos in the United States are foreign born and 60% were born in the United States. And we also know that uh, there are many, many, many mixed families in the United States, mixed families as in mixed immigration status families. 75% uh, of children in immigrant families are U.S. citizens. And so that gives us a little bit of context as to, as to the landscape of Latinos in the United States. And so what we've realized over the many years of expertise is that, that Latinos face, uh, thank you, Sarah, Latinos face a number of specific barriers to services. They have we have different realities, uh, different uh, uh, needs sometimes, uh, and there are best practices that can be culturally specific um, that that we we would like to advance. So, for example, Latinos are only half as likely to report abuse to authorities as survivors from other ethnic and racial groups. And of course, that number has changed given some of the the uh, the, the recent developments around immigration. Uh, and so, then the question becomes: So, what do we do? We know that Latinos Latinas are less likely to report abuse. Why is that, and how how can we respond? And, and we can ask this question for a number of marginalized communities. We know that. Latino practitioners feel isolation in the field in terms of working. Oftentimes, organizations will hire a Latina bilingual advocate as the token advocate, right? Who who can who who is the 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 know, knower of all cultures, if you will. And so, how do we as a national organization support those Latino practitioners in the field who need support and 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 and, and capacity building tools and resources? We also um, do a lot of public policy advocacy, as I mentioned, and and. And much of the public policy that has happened uh, in the United States has been very mainstream or have led to what we call unintended consequences, although it's not unintended ones we know we've known about them for for a decade or two. Um, so we continue to bring this up to the table. And then finally, we that we know we realize that there is a dearth uh, a dearth in research that is specific to Latino communities in the United States. And so we seek to to kind of bridge that gap. Um, on the next slide, I believe those are all the slides that I have. Um, Porvi, did you want to contextualize the next section around our holistic and intersectional frameworks? Sure. Uh, let me pull up. So in terms of, um, I believe actually the next slides are Pierre, your cycles of oppression. Correct. I just didn't know if you wanted yeah, so to contextualize. You, sure, I, I'll go. I'll jump oh, in. No, go go ahead and and then I'll jump back in. 
Sure. So on the thank you. So on the next slide, uh, we just wanted to really quickly touch on oppression uh, and 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 summarize oppression in two slides. And <laughs> so it's a feat. Uh, so forgive us for doing that. But oftentimes, you know, we are asked to to speak about you know what is oppression, what is intersectionality, and whatnot. And and it's difficult sometimes to find the language um, to 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 make people to some degree understand. So hopefully, this is a tool. That, that you as advocates, that you as, as, as trainers yourselves in your communities can use um, for people who, 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 who say, well, you know, something happened 100 years ago and therefore it's no longer relevant, people are no longer oppressed. So this is what we call the cycle of oppression and it might help frame some of the, the subsequent discussions that we will be having today. Uh, oppression starts with a myth is what, you, and again, this is a huge sum, a sum, uh, uh, synopsis or, or, or what is it called? Reduction of what oppression is. But it starts with myths or misinformation, uh, missing information stereotypes, right? And then that gets turned into, uh, into a socialized uh, component. So it's reinforced by institutions, it's reinforced by culture, by the government itself. The media perpetuates these myths and misinformation. Uh, our textbooks in, in, in our schools will perpetuate stereotypes, will, will not include information about um, the the uh, the genocide that have happened in the United States, for example, et cetera, et cetera. So it gets social. The myth gets socialized, and then those that that socialization then gets internalized by the communities. You know, there is a myth. Uh, there is this uh, equation of 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 the myth and the lie becomes the truth, and then that is you know they say well since if if this is true then we are different, and then that difference means that we are deficient, and then that gets taken. And 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 the system itself um, gets becomes oppressive against those individuals and and becomes prejudiced. So this is very kind of open ended uh, or, or very kind of in la la land. So let's take it to a specific example on the next slide. So in the next slide, you'll see here the myth here, for example, is that domestic violence is more prevalent in communities of color because those cultures condone violence. That is a myth that we hear all the time. You know, Black communities are more violent, Latino communities are more violent, and this is kind of the myth that, that gets perpetuated. And so then the socialization part comes in that more children of color uh, end up in child protection. Uh, there are higher rates of criminal sanctions for men of color, for example, right? So this is the socialized part. And then this gets internalized as men of color have been higher conviction rates, more children are removed from the homes, um, and and then uh, and then we end up with um, you know with with the perception there is more violence, and so then people believe that they are, if you will, inferior, which does is not shown at the at the bottom of the um, of the slide there. And then this gets turned then into into a, a systemic behavior in which people are scrutinized more closely. Um, we we say that they're underserving of ser uh, you know under, under uh, they they don't. Um, they don't deserve services, uh, more children are removed, and then we perpetuate the myth, and then the cycle continues, and we continue to, to, um, to, to oppress individuals. So um, I, I, got, I just got a time check that, that my time is almost up, and I just wanted to pause really quick and see if you had any comments, because I went through that incredibly quick, and so feel free to chat us, and then I'll respond in the chat or, in, or, you know, uh, um, uh, or, or via voice. So that is that is oppression one on one. Hopefully that tool is is useful and you can take it to communities if if need be. We just summarized oppression in two minutes. <laughs> Thank you, and then I pass it on to Purdy. Great. Thank you so much, Peter, for laying that groundwork. And I also just want to acknowledge and honor some of the comments that folks are putting into the chat. I know um, Nicole and James, you've been speaking to. Um, the impact of pathologizing trans and gender non-conforming and LGBT communities. And I think that's such an important issue and thinking also about our communities that Pierre just described, the ways that our communities are pathologized and then what that means in terms of scrutiny, criminalization, as well as access to services and resources. So thank you so much for including that information in the chat and please do continue to report out um, so I want to kind of give that broader context in terms of, again, how our communities are seen and then, you know, what does that mean in terms of access to services and resources and give the broader picture that our communities don't have access to resources because of historical oppression. 
And so the inequity that I'm going to speak to in terms of economic security and access is fundamentally tied to a history of oppression, um, erasure, eradication, genocide, slavery, and use of immigrant labor through abuse in this country. So that context is really for us um, important in terms of when we look at some actual details of economic inaccess and insecurity. So given the groundwork that Pierre laid and also that I just spoke to in terms of the histories of oppression, the work that we've been doing at WCN Inc. in our economic policy and leadership project is to lead with the vision that despite violence and inequity, our communities and survivors are resourceful and have been for centuries, and that we are entitled to economic security, a voice at every table, and safety and health for our communities. And in this, I want to really highlight that we don't see our communities as different from um, individuals, and that there is a fundamentally an individual and community connection in the work as we see it. We also believe the inventive innovations we make in our culturally specific responses and programs have the power to transform lives, communities, institutions, the field, and our society. So again, we believe in our work and the way in which we do the work and that the work is transformative. Next slide, please. So our goals in the Economic Policy and Leadership Project at WSN Inc. including include having um, community-informed policies and practice, raising leadership awareness on policy advocacy, because so often our field policy and direct services have been seen as competing interests, and we really show how they are not competing interests, but that good policy enables good direct services and supportive direct services, and also that we need to have on the ground day-to-day -day advocates who have the expertise of the impact of policy actions to be able to share this information. So we also create venues for advocates to share information and we work um, and in various forums and through webinars like this to really explain the impact of policies on underserved communities. Next slide, please. So I wanna um, give some information from a couple of different resources and I'm so excited because some of the folks who work at these centers are on the webinar as well and really just shout out that the work they're doing is so crucial. So the Institute for Women's Policy Research and the National Women's Law Center have been doing fantastic work in terms of looking at the gender wage gap. Why do we need an economic policy and leadership project when we're talking about gender-based violence? Well, one of the reasons we need it is that the gender wage gap is real. So we're about at 82 um, cents to the dollar at this point, but that gender wage gap is real and it also has a real impact. Next slide, please. So what would it mean for a real family in terms of the difference in pay for women and men? Um, it means things like three months of groceries, rent and utilities, childcare payments, health insurance premiums, six months of student loan payments, nine tanks of gas. So this is like the day-to-day -day reality of what it means about having a gender pay gap. Next slide, please. So when we think about this pay gap, um, we also want to recognize there's a disproportionate impact on women of color and indigenous women. So you'll see here that women of color are across the board paid less than white non-Hispanic men. African-American women make 63 cents for every dollar, Latinas 54 cents, Asian-American women 85 cents, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander women 70 cents, and for Native American women 58 cents. So this is a significant difference across the spectrum of women of color in terms of access to pay and resources. Next slide, please. We also see that in terms of um, the work, and again, I'm really citing incredible work that's been done by the Institute for Women's Policy Research, as well as the National Women's Law Center. Um, please do a look at those original resources. Um, what we see is that not only will we have to wait until 2059 for women to get equal pay, but Hispanic women would have to wait until 2248 and Black women until 2124. 
that is too long to wait. And so our work is designed to help increase visibility to these, to these issues and also the impact that economic um, insecurity and inability to have access to resources has on gender-based violence. Next slide, please. Um, we want to also acknowledge that the disparities in income and pay um, go across the spectrum. So, for example, lesbian women make less than men, regardless of sexual orientation. Um, we also see that trans women make less after they transition. Um, so, one third of workers found their earnings um, decrease. And also, women with disabilities similarly experience a wage gap, 72 cents to the dollar. Um, to 75 cents. So again, even within the particular categories, we see that these disparities continue. Next slide, please. And as our partner CSAJ shows, why we talk about this and the importance of it in that, again, it affects our everyday lives, what we can afford, what we have access to and resources, and fundamentally, a lack of economic security increases vulnerability to violence. So we see that there is a link between access to resources, between poverty and domestic violence. Next slide, please. Um, this access is not only in terms of what um, resources a survivor might have to pursue legal options or to pursue other kinds of avenues to respond to situations of violence, but it also causes long-term economic instability. So you might have income and job loss from abuse, you might have housing instability, there's inability to access transportation at times, and of course, decreased access to childcare. So these impacts are long term in terms of thinking about access to education, which again is later than an access to other kinds of higher pay. So you see how the cycle, a mirror to kind of the cycle of oppression that Pierre began with, how that plays out in an economic context. Next slide, please. So fundamentally, our work needs to have an anti-poverty lens. And why do we say that? We say that because if we had equal pay, it would reduce poverty by half for families with a working woman. So when we think about, again, the ways in which inability to have economic security reduces options for survivors of gender violence, we see simultaneously that enabling equity and pay and reducing poverty would allow for more options to open up. Next slide, please. So we're going to dive in now in terms of um, thinking about, again, a specific issue around economic security and a struggle in our communities um, in terms of systemic barriers and racism, which is over incarceration and immigrant detention, which is, of course, a very lively topic at this particular moment. And we're so happy to be able to give you this information resources um, currently in terms of what is possible. So go ahead. Next slide, please. So we wanted to really think about how we change strategies and from our perspective at the Women of Color Network Inc., how do we in our communities really define economic justice and what does it mean for our communities and survivors of color and immigrant survivors? Next slide. So this is information that is called, and I really want to lift up all the amazing advocates who are part of our economic policy and leadership work. Many of you are on the call, and it's just such a joy to be able to partner with you all. Um, and this information is lifted up from the voices of advocates in the field. This is how advocates in our field define for our communities what economic justice means. It includes access to affordable education, food, housing, and health care, including mental health and reproductive access, jobs with security, benefits, training, and living wages, resources and information, as well as safety, sustainability, community healing and connection, and fundamentally living with authenticity and dignity. Next slide, please. So when we think about historical oppression, we want to also counter that with catalyzing movement. So yes, being poor and of color has been a debt that keeps incurring interest, as Susan Burton says, and as Kashua Barr says, if leadership has failed, we are the new leaders. So we hold both of those realities of needing to understand historical oppression and also knowing that we are the new leaders. Next slide, please. 
So particularly, what does over-incarceration of trans survivors, immigrant detention, and mass incarceration mean for our communities and survivors of violence? Next slide. So when we look at the issue, we want to redefine safety in our terms. As Beth Ritchie points out, of women who are incarcerated, at least 85% have experienced gender-based violence. As Azadeh Shahshahani speaks to, immigrant detention is part of mass incarceration of people of color, and women in detention are often survivors of abuse. And as Didi Shamley says, there aren't services for trans people. The jail is actually used as a homeless shelter for trans women. Next slide. I'm referring now to the amazing work that the Transgender Law Center has done. And in their 2015 national survey of trans individuals living with HIV, they noted that 43% of respondents made less than 12,000 per year, and 41% indicated a history of incarceration. Cecilia Chung, um, who is one of the amazing participants on a webinar that we at WSN Inc. hosted last um, fall, which is on our website, we have reached the link to that whole webinar later in this um, presentation. Cecilia noted that if folks have a history of incarceration, they're likely to drop out of care, which leads to poor health outcomes and a higher likelihood of experiencing intimate partner and or state violence. She really underscores that everything is connected and that's why we in this real life example need to include work around economic and racial justice and involve the folks directly impacted, including trans survivors of color when designing and implementing programs. Next slide, please. In the immigrant context, Lillian Wecko, formerly of the Washington Defender Association, has given a powerful frame for us, which is that family is a powerful re-entry program, and that programs need to enable parenting programs and skill building for survivors when incarcerated in order to enable safety and self-sufficiency. And as some of the children that she cites say, um, that they really point to what would have helped me most is compassion for my mom, and that their connection to their family um, incarcerated is really part of not only being able to be able to enter successfully after incarceration um, into a family and society context, but also a reason for hope and a reason for both the parents and children to be able to um, be whole, holistic, and also encounter safety and wellness. And I put this in the context, as Lillian describes, that one in nine Black children have an incarcerated parent in this country. Next slide, please. There's a toolkit that has been released um, in terms of, and Pierre is going to talk very soon about immigrant detention and, um, and that component, but I wanted to briefly give you a toolkit that has been produced by the National Immigrant Justice Center um, around ICE contracts and inspections to end abusive detention. It's an adv advocacy and organizing toolkit. And the reason we need this is that litigation alone does not solve problems. We need to speak with policymakers and document stories with the media. And we also need collective action, including the kind of collective action that 22 mothers have taken at the Burke Family Detention Center. So we know recently that there have been more deaths in detention centers, and certainly that there has been a ramp up in terms of immigrant detention and deportation. And so there are tools that exist in terms of thinking about how do we actually respond with not only legislative responses, but also advocacy, organizing, and mobilization. So I know that was a lot of different information in terms of um, over-incarceration, how it also links in terms of um, survivors of violence who are incarcerated um, and the proportion of folks uh, doing that, as well as that given the context of our field um, and its over-reliance on incarceration systems the connections of that to immigrant detention, as well as over-incarceration of trans survivors. So I know that was a lot of information and there's a lot to dig into. And like I said, there are further resources towards the end of this webinar that you can also unpack these issues more. But at this moment, I'm gonna pass it on to Pierre so that he can um, take you deeper into immigrant detention and protections for immigrant survivors. <laughs> 
things for we actually I'm going to pass it on to Rosie because Ro this is um, uh, an area that Rosie is an expert on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much to CSAJ for hosting this webinar and inviting us to be a part of it. And thanks so much, Pierre and Pervy, for all the excellent information and, and context that you've shared. Uh, you know, building on what you've said, you know, the recognition that domestic violence and sexual assault ac exists across all communities, races, ethnicities, education levels, economic levels, yet we cannot pretend that there's only a one-size-fits-all because we do really need to pause and see how th these added layers of oppression or these barriers significantly impact survivors in different communities and what our response can be both to the individual to really be able to help them as well as systems advocacy that needs to be an important part of this as well. And so I appreciate the opportunity right now to talk about uh, this impact on immigrant survivors. And, you know, I think what's, what's uh, important to point out is that Congress, when it first created the Violence Against Women Act back in 1994 and in subsequent reauthorizations, uh, there's always been from the outset the recognition that abusers often exploit a victim's lack of immigration status as a tactic of abuse. And certainly that there is great fear and concern oftentimes on the part of immigrant survivors to seek support and services. You know, and so the question is, what can we do? What can we do in our policy, in our, in our community outreach, in our services, not to sharpen the tools of abusers in this context? And so Congress did create some important remedies, and I'm just going to touch briefly on those uh, a little bit further into this presentation. But it's important to, to recognize why that, that is so critical. And, and one of the things that we recognize is the heightened vulnerability. Um, PBS Frontline did two very powerful documentaries, if you haven't seen them. One was called Rape in the Field, and the other one was called Rape on the Night Shift, really highlighting how individuals at times specifically prey on immigrant Victim, on immigrants uh, as, as, because they know. They know they're afraid to seek safety by you know, contacting the police or to report the crime. They're afraid of losing that job, which is so very hard for them to obtain. And so the economic issues that Pervy mentions are so critical. And uh, they're afraid they won't be believed and that they themselves will end up being arrested and detained. And in fact, we do see that in a number of occasions, the vulnerability to arrest and detention of immigrant victims. Uh, so those are very real you know, fears and concerns that we need to address. And just last week, we did a briefing here in Congress on workplace and DV and SA policies. And there was a very courageous survivor who shared her story as a Latina woman working in Los Angeles cleaning buildings, and she talked about how vulnerable they are, that over 75% of the janitors are women, a huge percentage of them are immigrants, uh, many of whom are undocumented, but that the great majority of managers, the foremen, are, are almost all men, and that many times these women will work the only one on that floor late at night cleaning the building. And she herself had been a victim of sexual assault and how when, when her manager who came on the floor that night and assaulted her, he said to her, you know, if, if you go to the police, I'm going to instead, you know, say that I caught you trying to steal something. They're going to believe me and not you. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be deported. Who do you think they're going to believe, you or me? And she also was talking about how fearful she was that she couldn't lose that job because she had children to feed. So all these are very real realities. And in the context in which we find ourselves, we find that uh, over the last few months with the new executive orders, the new DHS memos, and essentially the changes in enforcement policies, that these risks and fears have been heightened uh, in immigrant communities. And especially as we hear about policies that seek to increase entanglement between local law enforcement and federal immigration enforcement, um, that that is certainly raising a lot of concern and fears. And the impact is very real. The, the police chief in Los Angeles uh, made a statement uh, at the end of March saying that in L.A. they already had seen a 25 percent drop in sexual assaults reported by Latinas compared to the same time period last year. They had seen that drop from the beginning of the year until the end of March and a 10 percent drop of reporting of domestic violence. And they were not seeing that drop across other communities. Uh, likewise, Houston, the police chief of Houston said that they'd seen reports of rapes by Hispanics drop 42.8% compared to last year. Um, 
So it has very real consequences when people are fearful of seeking help and services. And so we did do a survey to the field, uh, Casa de Esperanza, in, uh, in partnership with the National Network to NDV, the National Alliance on Sexual Violence, API GBV, and others. We uh, put out a, survey, a, a survey to the field in April, at the end of April, and we had 715 respondents, and we just developed a fact sheet on this, and we'll send this out as resources and materials that you all can use in your community outreach and your advocacy. But the question was posed, and we had 715 advocates and attorneys complete the survey, and, and the question was asked of them, are immigrant survivors sharing with your agency that they have concerns about contacting the police? And 78% responded yes. Uh, likewise, we asked if they had uh, reports from survivors about concerns of going to court for a matter related to the abuser or offender, whether it's civil court or criminal court, and 75% of advocates and attorneys reported yes. And in fact, 43% reported that they have worked with immigrant survivors who dropped civil or criminal cases recently because they were fearful to continue with their cases. Um, and in fact, NPR just did a piece on this this morning, and they they provide a link to the survey and quoted this survey from the DBSA field. So I think our voices are very important at this time to really raise these issues, raise these concerns, because sometimes, and it sort of goes back to what Pierre was saying about myths, there are certain myths. Uh, that immigrant communities somehow are more dangerous, myths that dehumanize or demonize individuals and communities, um, myths that perpetuate this notion that our communities will be safer if we detain and deport and lock up uh, in a widespread way, sweeping in you know, so many individuals. And really what, th what this is doing, and as we're seeing, it's, it's, it's really in, uh, undermining, undermining victim safety, the safety of their children, undermining public safety. And there are a number of police chiefs that have come forward to say this undermines public safety when people are fearful to seek services, to seek support. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not going to be able to go into these different immigration remedies in, in the uh, 12 minutes that I'm allotted here, but I do want to point out how critical it is for all of our programs to be aware of these immigration remedies that exist in VAWA and the Trafficking Victim Protection Act that have received bipartisan support. Um, and for example, the VAWA self-petition, as I mentioned, from 94 was created to recognize that at times uh, uh, an immigrant uh, victim may be married to someone who's a U.S. citizen or legal permanent resident, but they have chosen to keep their spouse in undocumented status because what greater tool of power and control than to keep someone in undocumented status, unable to seek employment legally? fearful of losing custody of their children and of being deported. So the VAWA self-petition is a critical remedy uh, that exists to allow that individual to, to submit a self-petition. The U visa is for individuals who Looks, looks like we lost Rosie. Rosie, we lost you for a minute. Do you mind backing up a couple sentences? Okay. Can you still hear me lost. now? Yes, you're good now. Sorry about that. Just okay, I'm sorry. At what point did you lose me? Uh, did you hear me talk about the VAWA self-petition and the U visa? Just, yeah, just there. Okay. Um, and the T visa is for uh, victims of trafficking. Um, and then again, how critical it is to connect people who might be able to apply for asylum, particularly we've seen a lot of women and children fleeing horrific levels of sexual violence, gang violence from Central America, uh, who should be recognized for what they are, which is really refugees fleeing persecution uh, and individuals who could be uh, entitled to asylum here in the U.S. and ensure that we connect them to attorneys and knowledgeable advocates that can help them. And, and special immigrant juvenile status also is an important status that might be available for unaccompanied minors. So we do have other webinars, other resources that really go into a lot more depth, but mostly it's to make sure that your program can connect individuals uh, to organizations in your community, to immigration lawyers, to people who know who are specialized in this training, that you develop the partnerships and that we can really connect uh, immigrant survivors to, to pursue these critical resources. Uh, next slide. 
And so really this also requires enhanced safety planning when working with immigrant survivors. And Jill Davies has a really good piece, you know, that talks about being aware of uh, the risks posed by abusers as well as systems risks, right? And so we do really need to be aware of that right now, um, that there are system risks right now uh, that when when immigrant survivors aren't sure what's going to happen, whether they can turn to the police, whether they can turn to the courts. And this requires really much greater advocacy in a coordinated community response, as well as helping them in their own safety planning uh, to be aware of what would happen if they are detained, what are some contingency plans for their children. Help immigrants to understand that they do have rights. Many times they think that they don't have rights if their uh, immigration status is unauthorized status, but they do have a right to remain silent. They do have a right uh, not to be pressured into signing something that they don't understand. They can ask to speak to an attorney if, if they are detained. And this is something important I want to point out. Because federal immigration is actually civil, it's not criminal, it's civil, they're not entitled to an attorney. Uh, but they can ask to speak to an attorney if they, if, they, if they know of one that they can turn to. So again, it's really important in our safety planning to make sure they have the name and number and that you know who are some attorneys that can help them if they are detained. Um, they, if, if, in, if questioned, if they're stopped, they can say, am I free to go? Or am I under arrest? And and there needs to be a, a basis if they're going to be detained um, and or to be arrested. And they can and they don't have to answer where questions like where were you born or what is your immigration status if they're just stopped by the police. So it's important for us to know what their rights are to share with them what their rights are. And we do have materials, excellent materials put out by the ACLU, by the Immigration Law Resource Center. There's some excellent webinars too. And in fact, I encourage you. There are a lot of trainings going on in communities right now about knowing your rights, because it does vary somewhat from jurisdiction to jurisdiction on some different aspects, for example, of how would you uh, provide for a power of attorney or an affidavit of care for an individual's child. So really get to know in your jurisdiction who are providing those trainings. How can you partner with them? How can you attend so that you can be more familiar with this? Or how can you invite them to come and present in your program? Uh, Next slide. Um, so, again, you'll see some of these resources, but also to know that if an immigrant woman or, or survivor is detained, there is an ICE locator. I provide a link to it here where you can look up and find where she is and hopefully be able to, to connect her to the type of advocacy and assistance that that survivor would need and really mobilize uh, resources because you can also, even if they haven't previously been able uh, to submit uh, you know, for for specific immigration remedies, there may be a basis to be able to do a cancellation or removal. Um, So really uh, do what you can to figure out what the resources are in your community and know that we are available for TA and that there are also other national TA groups that we list at the end that specifically provide training in TA uh, in working with immigrant survivors. Next slide. So I'm aware here of our limitations of time. Uh, I have about two minutes, but real quickly wanted to highlight how important systems advocacy is around these issues. Some of these things I've mentioned um, about strengthening collaborations with immigrant advocacy organizations in your community. And as your law enforcement jurisdictions begin to contemplate, do they want to uh, become a 287G jurisdiction. That's a that's something that's out there right now that different jurisdictions need to consider. It essentially means that local law enforcement would be deputized to also serve as immigration agents and be wearing two hats. The voice of DVSA advocates is critical in that conversation to highlight what the negative impact could be on victims and witnesses and on public safety. So your voice, your experience is really important to be a part of those conversations. Uh, Next slide, please. Um, And overall, I think we really need to reframe the narrative as as these discussions are happening. Again, number one, how do we address this myth that immigrants perpetrate more crimes? Uh, The American Immigration Council put out an excellent fact sheet, and we have it in our resources, showing that that simply is not true, that in fact, immigrants often actually commit less crimes than those born in the U.S., um, and so we really need to recognize that 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 certainly you know there are individuals um, who may be tied to drug cartels or gangs or what have you that are have committed felonies and where the criminal justice system has its role to play. But we cannot 
uh, support a myth that somehow this entire community uh, are, are demonized or dehumanized. Um, again, like I said, how do we educate the public that limiting victim and witness trust and law enforcement, and not just law enforcement, but to seek services, uh, undermines public safety? And third, how do we elevate this to a human rights framework? for why access to safety and justice is important for all victims, for all survivors. Really say that this is a basic human right to be able to live a life free from fear of violence and oppression, and that we need to make sure that, that any uh, survivor can access the support she or he needs. Next slide. Um, so we've talked about the enhanced collaborations. Next slide. And really making sure that in your jurisdiction that there are improved protocols for the U visa certification that law enforcement would need to provide. Like I was saying, I think when I cut out, is that in some jurisdictions there are great policies and codes, and in others it's almost impossible to get a law enforcement certification. And that just isn't right that an immigrant survivor, that a pathway to safety, a pathway to immigration status and support could be limited uh, by the ways in which a local jurisdiction is implementing this. So there's some excellent resources. And in fact, the Department of Homeland Security put out this whole certification guidance that really explains to law enforcement the importance of setting up good pro protocols uh, to assist uh, immigrant victims to be able to pursue a U visa. And also, the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project has an excellent toolkit as well. Uh, next slide. And then this is a critical aspect. How do we ensure adequate language access? As we said, if we're going to do enhanced safety planning, explain to people their rights and the challenges, we can't do this unless we can adequately communicate. And really, this is a civil rights issue. That, and so, but it's also an obligation of all of our service providers that receive federal funding. We need to ensure that there is meaningful access to services for individuals with limited English proficiency under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. And there's some excellent resources. Uh, there's a whole website called LEP.gov. LEP stands for Limited English Proficient. And uh, the National Latino Network has a whole toolkit to help your program develop proactive language access policies and to do systems advocacy. In fact, we just recently did a whole webinar on how you can do some systems adv advocacy in the course courts to make sure there's adequate language access in the courts and also with the police. So please check out that toolkit and you, we'll also send a link to the webinar. Um, but we also find sometimes where the police don't have adequate language access, it can lead to dual arrest where oftentimes they will also arrest the victim or where the abuser who speaks English better will accuse the victim that she in fact or he uh, is the one who is the perpetrator and then they both get arrested. And then once that victim is fingerprinted and the fingerprints are sent to ICE, that also automatic, or to FBI, it also automatically goes to ICE. So there's huge vulnerability uh, in a dual arrest or in arresting the, the wrong individuals. So that's why we have to do advocacy for language access with the police as well and to make sure the police do not use children as interpreters, which in and of itself is not trauma-informed, is abusive to children and undermines language access uh, for the survivors. Um, next slide. And this is my final slide I'll cover, which is to make sure that there is access to the services necessary for life or safety, regardless of immigration status. And there's a special letter that was just recently put out by Department of Justice, HUD, and Health and Human Services. Um, you'll see a link there, and we also have it in our resources, making it clear that uh, that victims, survivors should be able to access these services critical for life or safety regardless of their immigration statuses. And that certainly includes shelter programs, transitional housing, prevention programs, uh, a wide range of programs. We can provide more TA on that, uh, but it's important to make sure that, that, that people are not being denied access to these critical services. So I'll wrap up there and I look forward to, to uh, taking your questions. Thank you. Yay, Rosie! Um, this is Porvi again, and I'm so excited to follow up on that amazing information um, and tools and resources. One of the things that I'm thinking through is, again, just threading the dots and the connections. So, for example, in terms of looking at immigrant detention issues, we understand that many survivors of gender-based violence are fleeing Central America and other home countries um, in order to escape abusive situations and contexts. And what happens then, unfortunately, when they come here is that many are put into immigrant detention 
So again, we want to kind of circle back to like, why are these threads connected? Why is it important for us to have holistic responses and make these connections, which is to say that not only um, have a vast folks um, in terms of women who are incarcerated face gender-based violence at some point, it has a specific impact in terms of political forces, in terms of immigration forces, and the push and pull of immigration um, and crossing borders is also fundamentally connected to gender-based violence. So thank you, Rosie, for bringing out so many of those immigrant detention resources. I want to echo and push further now in terms of what do we mean by healing and liberation? And many of you in the chat, um, Anna, Ade, Nicole, have talked about looking at our whole lives, looking at our whole experiences, not just the trauma of our lives, but also just our wholeness and being and thinking about what does it mean to enable long-term security. For us at the Women of Color Network, Inc., that fundamentally is a question of what does it mean to enable access to healing and liberation? And so for survivors in our community, what does healing mean? That's part of what we want to center as a strategy for fundamental transformation and change. So I'll give you now also a few voices for our economic policy and leadership project that really center um, in the next slide what healing means from our vantage point. Marcia Olivo, the executive director of the Miami Workers Center, speaks to how we merge community organizing and healing because community organizing is healing. The truth about healing is it is a way of life. So we just walk through a number of responses that are administrative, legislative policy responses, but we really want to lift up that community organizing and advocacy is also healing work. And as Joyce Kyle says, the justice system didn't recognize abuse as I didn't have scars. Healing for me is accepting the justice system needs repair. So that our work to enable true access to justice, our work to embolden our communities and mobilize, that is healing work. And it looks at our long-term sustainability as well as the needs that we have holistically. As Linda Eagle Speaker says, as Native Americans, we heal in ceremony. We must value our spirit. So part of the fundamental crisis of capitalism is a alienation from our spirits and thinking about the larger spirit economy and what it means to be home in our spirits is fundamental to liberation and healing. Next slide, please. I wanna lift up um, and ask CSAJ, uh, mentioned at the beginning, um, OKC Artists for Justice is one of the impact sites on our current race equity project. And we at WSN Inc. Um, have been admirers of their work. And again, Grace was one of the presenters, on, Grace Franklin was one of the presenters on our webinar in the fall, which is a resource at the end of this um, set of slides. Um, and we want to acknowledge and really lift up the work that Grace Franklin and OKC Artists for Justice have been doing um, in terms of creating spaces for community power and healing. They came into organizing in terms of thinking about, um, in, in terms of the work to really um, mobilize around the Daniel Holtzclaw case. Um, and that has been a powerful process of recognizing that Holtzclaw targeted poor black women, many of whom who had records, criminal records, and therefore felt vulnerable um, to reaching out to law enforcement in terms of sexual assault. So again, we see the system and circle of oppression in terms of access to resources, in terms of vulnerability to violence, and then in terms of vulnerability to reporting or inability to access justice. Um, OKC Artists for Justice mobilized the community. They really lifted up the need for justice, for the need for looking at a response that actually enabled accountability. And as we know, because of their organizing, we have been successful in that accountability. In addition to that work towards accountability, the work that, um, that OKC Artists for Justice has been doing has also been creating healing spaces. So again, they're a perfect example for how advocacy goes along with healing and that those two things not only work in tandem, but are part of the same um, work together holistically. Next slide, please. 
We at the Women of Color Network have also been thinking, um, as Rosie spoke to, um, changing the narrative, flipping the script. And what does it mean, again, to flip the script around what it means to heal, create space for ourselves, and to be free? Next slide. So some of the things that we can do, and again, you'll get access to this full presentation, so I'm not going to go into each bullet point in terms of strange change strategies, um, but these are some of the ways that we can take action to really ensure that we are empowering survivors and working at the intersections and offering intersectional solutions. So we want to consolidate meetings and case plans in order to help focus survivors' energies. We want to provide safety planning for survivors in terms of leaving work environments. Sometimes we're not always thinking about the work context and we want to lift that up. We want to foster linkages to holistic services like housing, mental health, substance abuse, transportation, and childcare services. And we fundamentally also need to embrace the complexity and understanding that survivors may have participated in illegal activities in the process of surviving. And that is part of also the context of oppression. Next slide, please. In terms of things that we can have as resources, entrepreneurship, such as gardening or microenterprise, thinking about what it means to have individual and community help, thinking about job training and planning and skills as part of integrating our services and really, again, thinking about the question of long-term security, which some of you have raised. And then again, thinking about family reunification processes and disrupting systems that are designed and act to break up families. And fundamentally, offering avenues for creative responses, storytelling, and sharing of success. Next slide. We want to also create awareness of these connections. We as a field need to understand the connections between direct services and policy advocacy, and we need to make these connections and we need to lift them up. So we need to do our own work in terms of documenting stories, data, pushing those narratives forward, and making sure that our stories then inform policy conversations and that our communities are at the center of policies that have a day-to-day -day impact on us. Next slide, please. What we want to make sure happen and the outcomes that we're looking for is that we want to really fulfill our goals for safety and healing. That's the fundamental frame that we want to look to. We do want to enable more white women and aspiring allies and men to be involved in the movement. We need to respond to misinformation and attacks on our work. And we want to make sure that we can serve everyone, including folks who don't fall into the restrictive funding guidelines that often frame our programs. And as we've had as a recurrent theme, we want every survivor to be able to be comfortable accessing any agency or resources support that exists. Next slide. So here's the set of resources that I mentioned. Again, you'll all get this webinar um, and presentation sent out to you. Um, the webinar that I referred to um, earlier, which has Cecilia Chung, Jennifer Chan, um, Noreen Hill, um, Grace Franklin, other folks on it, speaking to economic security. That's all on um, the WSN Inc. website here. We also have a fact sheet on UNT visas and policy advocacies and reducing institutional bias, as well as re-entry, survivor, survivors re-entering communities. So all of that information is at that link there. You can also sign up for our updates and you can follow us um, at WCN Network and my personal handle, which is at Poor v. Poet. Next slide. I just want to end before I pass it on to Pierre um, in terms of thinking about, again, the linkage of economic justice and movement building for survivors in our communities. So recently, um, we had this amazing example um, from Southerners on New Ground and the Black Lives Matter movement of the Mamas bailout, where they had community members raise $40,000 to bail out folks, mo mothers who were in jail because they couldn't afford bail. And so again, we really come back to why are we thinking about economic security and access to resources and who is punished um, in terms of not having access to resources. And so 
Uh, even in the climate that we are currently in, I want to lift up these radical and amazing and beautiful ways of community organizing and why we need to organize as communities and not only rely on simple or conventional policy advocacy, because this is, again, the work of liberation. And as Kiyomi Fujikawa shows, um, shifting the economic realities for trans people is essential and is a violence prevention strategy. So the work that we're doing is both mobilization towards liberation, but also preventing violence to begin with. And I'll pass it off in terms of the next slide to Pierre, who's going to give you again some incredible resources from within our own community. Sure. Thank you, Pruvi. Um, so these are resources that are just in general that I'd like to highlight that you can find on our website, www.nationallatinonetwork.org. We'll put it on the chat. And um, there are four, co uh, four toolkits, really five, that we've, we've put out um, that, I'll, that I'd like to go through briefly. So let me see really quick here something. Uh, the first one is Te Invito, and this is a toolkit to engage men and boys, Latino men and boys. It's a bilingual campaign that, um, that, that has uh, documents, it has videos, it has posters. Again, if your community wants to engage men and boys, in this in this in this work, theinvito.org is a, a great website, and we just uh, we're just about to release uh, the facilitator's guide, which takes a lot of the material that is found on the website and puts it into a a, a rough kind of curriculum uh, skeleton that organizations can take and um, and use it with with men and boys in your communities. And on the next slide. Um, We'll see, well, again, this is free bilingual material and all of the material that we have is customizable. So you don't have to do any design. If it's, if, if it's a PSA, you can pull from the website and then, uh, or we can send you the, the file and then you can add your logo, your information, your, your organizational uh, you know, infor information. And again, we do this because we realize that many communities don't have the resources to produce uh, these type of materials. On the next slide, um, we'll see the Building Evidence Toolkit, um, www.buildingevidence.org, or you can just go to the very bottom of our homepage, nationallatinonetwork.org, and then you have the link to all of them. Um, and next slide, please. You will see that, uh, thank you, that the, the Building Evidence Toolkit is free, bilingual, easy to use tools to help you document the success of your work and the impact of your work. And we created this toolkit for two reasons. One of them was that many culturally specific communities uh, as many of you know, don't receive federal funding or don't get funding because they say, well, where is the evidence that your work is, you know, is, is efficient or, you know, is, 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 is uh, effective. And, um, and so then communities say, well, we don't have the funding to be able to, to, uh, to produce this kind of, you know, material that you need to, to prove that our work works, that, that our work is good. And so, uh, and so we say, you actually, you do have a lot of this material. So we'll, uh, we'll show you where you have all of this material and expertise that you're already doing it. Uh, and, and you can, you know, uh, turn the, the work that you're doing into, into evidence and you can demonstrate how it's effective. And the other reason that we created it is that, that uh, we didn't want to perpetuate the cycle, obviously, of, you know, well, people don't have the, 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 the tools to do evaluation, so they don't get funding, and they need the funding to do evaluation, and so, you, and so they never, you know, they never get out of that. Um, and so we wanted people to be able to, 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 to document their work for funding, but then the other reason was that we wanted to, um, to give people uh, and organizations tools to be able to evaluate their work and make changes based on those evaluations. So that's another tool that you can use. And on the next slide um, is the language access, which is languageaccessplans.org. And this one on the next slide, please, will it's a, it's a bilingual, again, all of our tools are bilingual, uh, bilingual tools to help your organization create language access plans. It takes you through a step-by-step -step modules. Uh, if you're starting from scratch, uh, so what you need to do to, to, you know, to, to have a language access plan, uh, and if you already have a language access plan, how do you enhance it? How do you evaluate it? How do you, uh, how do you test it out and make modifications, right? Uh, so that's part of the language access toolkit. And then the other parts of it is systems advocacy. You know, you have a plan, it's working, and you're doing it great at your own organization, but how do you uh, encourage other organizations to, to also implement and uh, or develop and implement language access plans? And the next toolkit on the next slide is the language access in the courts. This is specifically it's a toolkit 
to enhance the capacity of courts to provide um, to provide uh, survivors or petitioners with with uh, language access. Um, and, and again, this is specifically for to, to do advocacy in the courts um, to, to you know to 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 work with the, judi with the judicial system. And this one you can download from our website as well. And then on the next toolkit uh, is the Decimos No Mas or www.wesaynomas.org. Uh, and the website is specifically around, again, bilingual, encouraging parents to talk with their children uh, or youth about uh, healthy sexuality, healthy relationships, and healthy relationships. So again, we are uh, we are looking at these issues from two from two angles, which many of you are already looking at. One of them is intervention. You know, what do we do in response to what's happening nationally, to immigration rates, all of this stuff. And the other one is prevention. What do we do in order to prevent some of the violence from happening within you know within our own communities? And how do we bring our children up to uh, in, a, in a healthy relationship, in a healthy having a, a healthy relationship with their own sexuality and others? So that's some of the toolkits that I want to make sure that you're aware of because um, it, they're free and they're, they're plentiful and they're, they're great for organizations, advocates to, to look at it and use. Thank you, Purvi. Great, thank you so much, Pierre. And next slide. We wanted to circle back from all these amazing resources and again, counter the opening frame. Yes, we have historical questions. We have economic inequity that we are addressing Yes, survivors of color and indigenous survivors have um, additional oppressions that we need to challenge, but we also have the opportunity to heal in interdependence and as liberation. As Noreen Hill says, I use my culture to get back to my healing and wellness. We are medicine for each other, and that possibility exists. We can mobilize that as, as we've seen. And finally, as Elhern said, healing should center work on violence we need to create opportunities for love. And that is the vision that we want to remember, the work of creation, the work of liberation that our activities enable. It's not only violence mitigation, but it's really opening up the space for joy and love. And we'll pass it now on to y'all in terms of asking questions or being able to dialogue a little bit. Wow, thank you so much. Pierre, Purvi, Rosie, I'm gonna invite Lisa Lynn and Erica and all the panelists back to kind of talk a little bit. If any of our attendees have questions or reflections or wanna share a little bit about um, how they're, how you all are engaging in the work, I know that our panelists are, are really curious and we all would like to lift up what what folks are doing, what you're seeing, and what you're doing um, in your communities. Um, so please engage with us a little bit, ask some questions, or share a thought as we have a couple minutes to wrap up today. Um, while that's coming in, for all of our panelists, I do have a couple questions for you all that I've been holding. Um, one is about data, and another, I think maybe first, that's a little broader. I think it's an interesting question and it comes up a lot. So um, someone asked, how do we address some of the short-term needs that survivors have while making or creating some of the space to be critical and building um, building out for longer term um, security and, and this movement building work that you're all talking about? It'd be great to hear from both WCN and CASA, any thoughts on, on some of those tensions folks are feeling? Well, this is Rosie. Thank you for that question. I think it's an excellent question because I think the challenge sometimes, of course, you know, that advocacy is so much need day-to-day -day working with individual survivors and at the same time are aware of the need to work for systems reform and, and to go beyond social services to social transformation. And so I think it is a, an important challenge for how we can do both of those and, and how we can have the support of our organizations to recognize that our mission, you know, should, should entail an opportunity to do both of those. And, you know, one example I can just, that calls to mind is I remember when we um, had done a webinar on language access and there was an advocate from Rappahannock, Virginia, who said, well, you know, in my court system here, they say that survivors are only entitled to an interpreter in court on a criminal case, not on a civil case. And in our webinar, we highlighted and provided a link to 
the civil rights letter that had come out of DOJ to all court administrators, reminding them they all receive federal funding and they need to have meaningful access across the entire court system. And what was great is this advocate later followed up and shared with us that she not only went in and got an interpreter for her own you know, clients in court as she was a court advocate, but she then used that to do some systems advocacy and, and went to the court overall and to the coordinated community response team and said, you know, how do we change the policy? You know, she showed the letter for the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, and they're like, oh, okay, you know, you're right. And, and it's not that perhaps they didn't know. It's that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? And an, and an individual who's an immigrant and who's limited English proficient is not going to be able oftentimes to do, to have the knowledge of their rights and to do that kind of systems advocacy. So it really is incumbent on all of us. So I thought that was a great example of how she helped not just her own client have an interpreter, but actually helped change the system, the court system, to make sure that all individuals who were LEP could access the courts. This is Lisa Jacobs uh, from CSAJ. I just wanted to thank all of our wonderful panelists, um, but also to reflect, I think, on some of the things that have come up in the chat window. One thing that people are looking for, and I'm sure that my colleagues can point them more effectively than I can, is the kinds of resources that are out there for people who are doing domestic and sexual violence advocacy and they may not necessarily do the immigration piece on a daily basis, but nevertheless, they have immigrant clients. So if they're looking for resources for their clients or for themselves to get better traction on that work, where can they find um, materials like that? The other thing I just wanted to ask folks to perhaps chat about is that in doing this work with the REAP project and certainly working with the two partners on the phone, I think we have all faced a variety of ways in which the work is more complicated over the course of the last couple of months and ways in which law enforcement and prosecutors and others in the courthouse um, can either be allies or be more complicated in the struggle to get access to justice for our clients. So if there are particular reflections that uh, folks on the phone have about ways in which you know, their work is pretty much the same or it's more challenging, and if so, the ways in which uh, you and the folks that you work with are responding to those challenges, we would certainly love to hear that. Um, but in the meantime, if my if my colleagues could, uh, my REAP partners could respond on this question of where to find good resources on immigration issues in particular, um, that would be great. Thanks. Yes, thank you for that question. So there, and we will be sending a link to a number of different resources, but I do want to highlight that OVW does fund two specific national TA providers on the whole issue of, of immigration uh, remedies for immigrant survivors. One is the National Immigrant Women's Advocacy Project out of American University, and their acronym is NIWAP, N-I-W-A-P dot org, and they have an entire resource library and many uh, webinars and also TA, and there you'll also find links to how to access legal services. And the other one is ASISTA. A-S-I-S-T-A, -S -S and, and their website is assistahelp.org. Likewise, have a number of resources, listservs, and connect people as well to, to, to legal services around this. So um, we will, I'll put that right now in the chat, but we'll also be sending links to those, to those TA sites, as well as CASA, sometimes an API, API GBV that we provide you know, general information and training and resources, but those other two centers specifically delve into much more specific uh, legal questions for immigrant survivors. I'll let my colleagues answer your other question, Lisa Lynn. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Rosie. And I would also say again, 
Um, our link in terms of the WSN Inc. page has information from the National Immigrant Justice Center, which was responsible for the ICE toolkit that I referenced. And so there are um, a host of resources in addition to the one Rosie mentioned. Um, so please do follow up. And I believe actually, Sarah, if you can advance some of the slides, y'all can see some of the resources that we have in um, this PowerPoint as well in terms of things to look up. So. I, I know that there has been a lot of information that we have given you, and um, it's you know just such a joy to be able to hear about some of the victories that some of you are reporting. Cecilia, congrats on the language access advocacy with NYPD. I know that's an ongoing situation, so thank you all for also sharing the works in which you continue to advocate and the ways in which you're really thinking about the communities that you're serving. Um, it's such an honor to be able to partner with you all. So here are some of the resources that um, Rosie and I just mentioned. And, you know, there are a host of resources out there and we're so pleased to be able to offer you some of that information. Yes, this is Erica. And wow, I just want to express so much gratitude to Pervy and Rosie and Pierre for sharing your work and your perspective and your spirit today with all of us. Your partnership means so very much to us. Um, uh, Pervy just mentioned the resources and you'll receive all of those resources with direct links to, to them once you get the PowerPoint presentation. I know lots of people have been asking for that. I also was going to hop over to share some other resources that we at CSAJ have to share with you just briefly. The first is that we have a newly released atlas which is called Accounting for Economic Security, an atlas for direct service providers. And this was developed um, by CSAJ staff and partners, some of whom are on this call today. The Atlas is a resource that's focused on enhancing economic security. And really it's about a paradigm shift. Um, it pushed based on um, research data and lots of experiences and wealth of information from advocates and survivors. It pushes for a shift in um, paradigm from one of econ economic self-sufficiency to one that really focuses on enhancing the economic agency of survivors and the communities of which they are a part. Uh, the first atlas was, the first map book of the atlas was just released about a month or so ago. And that focuses on mapping the terrain um, it's really uh, drawing together research and setting forth these four different, what we call guideposts for shifting the way in which um, advocates may engage in this work. The next two map books are, are yet to come, um, but one will focus on navigating the terrain, really honing in upon legal advocacy strategies within the current um, context. And then the third map book will be focused upon changing the terrain, focusing on systems and policy change work that targets economic barriers. So please keep your eyes open for that. The next slide focuses on CSAJ's core resources. One resource that we don't have listed here is our brand new guidebook on consumer and economic civil legal advocacy for survivors. It is a 250 page um, resource that was just released, um, res responsive to and written by incredible advocates across the country on concrete areas of intersection in consumer and gender-based violence work. So we um, urge you to take a look at that. Some of the other core resources that we have highlighted here include our national needs assessment report, um, our uh, article on economic ripple effect and the implications for advocacy, um, a report on CSAJ's pilot site and demonstration site work with some best practices that folks may want to think about in their own context as well as CSAJ's assessment tool for attorneys and advocates. We have a resource library that houses all of our webinars, including today's webinar um, and all of the other past 
REAP webinars, as well as the consumer rights and other CSAJ work. So if you're interested in accessing those recordings and materials, I urge you to take a peek at that. Coming up for REAP's work, um, we have um, some webinar, well, I should say that all of the webinars that have already taken place are archived. And um, on June 29th will be part two of these webinars. Um, it will be featuring our a couple of our other partners, the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, as well as the Texas Council on Family Violence. So please go ahead and register if you're interested. August 24th will be um, the next webinar that is focused on race equity in practice with rich learning from our impact sites, um, OKC Artists for Justice, as well as Enlace Comunitario, both of whom were mentioned during today's call. So we're very much looking forward to that. And then October 26th will be another and our final webinar in this series focused on strategic learning and race equity reports and recommendations from the field. If you're interested in learning about that process, I also urge you to get in touch with us um, and the webinar will bring all of that together on the 26th of October. All of that said, thank you, thank you so very much to Pervy, Rosie, Pierre, and to all of you who have participated today and for the powerful work that you do every day. So much appreciation. And this is Sarah, just to echo all of that and to encourage you and to connect some of the dots between um, um, Porvi mentioning how important it is to ground this work in what you all are doing. After this, you'll be directed to a, a brief little, um, not evaluation, but a check-in really. Um, let us know what you are thinking and what you need, as well as um, what you're doing. So we can continue to lift that up um, and uh, ground ourselves in, in all of that work. So um, just want to echo Erica's gratitude for our panelists. Thank you, Lisa Lynn, for guiding this process. Um, and thank you all for joining us. And we will be in touch directly very soon so you get all of these rich resources right in your hot little hands.